then for a hockey tournament. And um, I was going to move it till tomorrow. And then she told me there were like 40 people registered. So I figured I should probably keep it if I could. So thank you guys for jumping on. <clears throat> Anybody have anything, any exciting market news or just random excitement? Any gratitudes out there? We could start with gratitude. That would be fun. Right, Andrea? Oh, and yeah. Amber? yeah. Nope, that's fun. Oh, <laughs> see? In Amber and out of the frame too thing. fast. Right? <laughs> <laughs> What's your gratitude? Champagne and hot tubs with sunshine yesterday? <laughs> Yes, we were living it up yesterday. Sunday, fun day. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started here in just a second. I've got a, we've got a, our championship game at one or at 340 today. So we got to get out of the hotel here shortly. So I'm going to probably make it a shorter one, but I'm not going to cheat you guys on information. I promise. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. and get rolling does anybody have any questions up front anything that they're really jonesing to uh to learn about or talk about um that may or may not be in my slides don't be shy jill you're so nice that you have your camera on so i know you must have a good question oh a bunch of people have their camera on cool hey kim all right, let's roll. All right, so thank you guys for coming. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Troy Marsh. I am an agent in Columbus, Ohio. I'm also a real estate coach with I Love Coaching. I'm also an investor, a former team leader, and I just love numbers. So I started doing this um, kind of as a way to support the market center last year, and it went pretty well in terms of people coming on every month. So I decided I'd just keep doing it until people stop showing up and you guys keep showing up. So I keep doing it. So thanks for that. So we'll jump right in. Um, feel free to interrupt me to raise hands, put in the chat, although sometimes it can be hard for me to monitor that. So if anybody sees any good questions in the chat and you're somebody like Andrea that doesn't mind interrupting or Kim, I know you would do it too. Feel free to do that and let me know that there's something in there to answer and I'll stop and answer it. Um, then I'll have a time for questions and discussion at the end as well. So, um, so what we're going to do is go through inventory and selling trends. We're definitely going to talk about inflation and interest rates, which in my opinion are probably the most important indicator and driver to what's going to happen in the future. Obviously, the, the selling trends are more about what's happened in the past which is good to know. And yet it doesn't really, you know, really everybody wants to know what our crystal balls say, right? So we're going to try to talk about that. Um, knowing your lending and then also um, talking again about how you can use this data to impact your business. So we're going to start off like we always do with kind of a national look because I know um, there are people on here from different markets and then I'm going to drill into Central Ohio, uh, Columbus area, which is my market. Um, but I think there is there are benefits to everyone for seeing those numbers, just to understand the difference between that the national numbers and local numbers. So I'm going to encourage for those of you that aren't in Columbus to go out and look at your local numbers, whether it be from your local board or whether it be uh, from a program like we have called Trend Graphics. There are also um, some local some local numbers on the realtor.com site, which is completely free and public. There are also um, some numbers on Redfin. Redfin has some really good public data. And there are a bunch of paid services that you can jump onto as well. So um, so we'll jump right in here to the uh, to the market. So active listings, this again are the national numbers. We're down in December compared to November, which is uh, very normal from a seasonal perspective. As you can see, um, typically inventory tends to 
to drop and or level out at the beginning of the year. And then we hit seasonal highs in May, June, July, usually maybe into August as the end of the peak. And then things tend to go down. Now, during the pandemic, things got a little bit crazy in terms of seasonality. And so that's what you can see in some of these numbers, um, specifically in 21 uh, on the active listings. Um, the one thing that I'm always looking for are us overtaking certain trend lines, and that would be the 2021 numbers. So um, we still are um, over the number of active listings that we had in December of 2020, uh, which is important um, just because now we're over the last two years. That being said, the other important number is, is that we're still well below the previous three years, which we would all, I think, agree were, was a more normal market. So we, I tend to look when I'm looking at the uh, significance of a statistic at comparing it to, and that's why I like Realtor.com's numbers, comparing it to like 27 or 2017, 18 and 19, and then looking at 20 and 21 as kind of like the crazy years, specifically 21. And then obviously, um, 22, the beginning of 22, 22 is kind of like the tail of two markets, right? The first half was really crazy, as you can see from the active listings, which most of you experienced most likely. And then we kind of see a, saw a pretty sharp rise in uh, May, June, July. And then really things kind of leveled off. And so this is the leveling off of active listings is something I think is really important because it shows you that um, that there was a certain level of uh, demand in the market that wasn't able to be broken. Um, and it also, as we'll get to in a second, it also showed us that although the, the, there are fewer buyers out there, there are also fewer new listings. So first, we're going to talk about pending sales, though. Again, this yellow line here. Um, represents 2022 and the pendings going into uh, the, the end of the year were down and that should say November or December 2022, not November. Sorry, I didn't change that. We're down 35.6 or 36.8%. Actually, I didn't change the slide at all. So sorry about that. Um, but we have dropped below that 2019 level. Um, which is an important number because to that we really this is one of the few stats that we've dropped below um, 9, 17, 18, 19. And so pendings are a really good indication of what's going to happen in the future. Um, and so this is definitely a stat to keep an eye on. Now, as you'll see, again, when you look at your local market, it may be different. Remember, national national numbers um, also include some areas of the country that have seen massive declines. So I don't know if there's anybody on here from uh, Western United States, but certainly places like Arizona, um, Austin is kind of like South and West, um, but Denver, um, definitely, um, what's the big, uh, there's a big city out West and I can't think of the name of it, Boise, Idaho, I know saw a huge drive up in activity. Those markets have been hit much harder which is pretty normal, much harder than um, the markets that were going up still at great rates, but not quite as, as fast as them. Um, the new listings, though, are definitely down well below all of the levels. And so in some ways, as you'll see in a, in a later graph, the drop in new, the significant drop in new listings has actually helped to make it make sure that things didn't go really crazy in terms of the market changing because we really weren't, didn't have, <clears throat> even though we had a um, much lower number of buyers, because we had so, so fewer new listings coming into the market, the active inventory still hasn't really been able to go up significantly in the majority of markets. Um, so again, new listings were down 21% compared to last year, which they were already lower last year. And again, the number one of my favorite phrases is, is that homeowners just were not willing to sell their 3% mortgage to buy a 7%. Um, however, I do feel and we've got some data to support it. Um, I don't have a slide in here, but I've watched a couple of webinars with some of these deep analytics companies. And it sounds like the magic number statistically is around five and a half percent 
basically they see consumer behavior change pretty significantly around that number. I know for many of us in the market or in the country, um, I know rates are on average around 6%, but I know here in central Ohio, they're definitely in the fives. Um, and I think if we see that trend continue that we've seen over the last couple of weeks, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, I would suspect that we're going to have potentially a busier than expected spring if rates can get down to or below that 5.5% 5 5 kind of threshold. Um, days on market, as you would anticipate, with higher inventories is up. Um, we're up 11 days over last year. But again, keeping in mind perspective, you know, you, you we're comparing ourselves to probably one of the greatest um, markets that ever was. And that was the market that occurred in 2021. And so now we're about equivalent with December of 2020, which was still actually a great market. That was during the pandemic. And we definitely... Um, Things were kind of buzzing at that point or humming along, buzzing. That's That means I have an 11-year-old that talks in a lot of slang, sorry. But buzzing means it was going well. Um, but still, uh, still, again, right at 2019 levels so or 2020 levels. Median list price still up year over year. Um, however, we are, because we've been dipping since the peak in June, we're starting to get pretty close to year over year being at the same. And if we stay on this trend line, we're, we're going to dip below last year. So we've got a couple more months probably um, of saying that we're up year over year. But if the decline continues to happen, we're going to quickly go into the negative. So that and that could impact consumer confidence a little bit. So that's the one thing. It'll be interesting to see how normalizing interest rates kind of um, interact with what is certainly going to be negative press. Um, if when the media has a chance to talk about something negative, they're going to do it. So as soon as we get back to um, like March, probably, if this trend line continues, we're going to be talking about year over year drops in median pricing. And that's when the media is probably going to have a heyday. And it's going to be super important for you guys to understand um, what the current market is and what you believe the future market is going to hold so you can make, you know, advise your clients accordingly. Um, we did see a little bit of a sharper decline in December, but honestly, if we look back at pre-pandemic levels in terms of pricing, you can see that typically we reach a price peak somewhere in the May-June time frame. And then things slowly start to dip through December, January, typically, um, and then start to bump back up in February, March. And our hope is just that February, March, April, May are higher than last year, right? We want to go a little bit like higher on the low end and obviously a little bit higher on the high end. And that's the typical seasonal trend. A lot of people don't realize that, that prices tend to fall. Um, on average, um, in the fourth quarter, and then rebound, start to rebound in January, and then really increase the most each year between about February and May, and then plateau, and then start another decline um, into the third and fourth quarter. And so, if we go back to that typical trend line, that would that would show that we should be kind of turning the corner in January in this month. So if we are meeting here again in a month and talking about another decline in median listing price, then that's bucking a normal seasonal trend. And that's something that will, will hold a little bit more power. So we'll see what happens there. Um, price reductions definitely are uh, up. Again, this was another slide. I apologize that I didn't adjust the number, but our number was 13.6%. Um, um, but it was only up 6.5% compared to last December. So it's an interesting, uh, an interesting look. And obviously you can see that it's following what I would consider to be a pretty normal trend line there um, based on years past. So, um, all right. So this, this slide I had last month and I left it in, obviously I updated it 
um, for December numbers. But I think it's really, really important for, for those of you on the call here to identify the differences amongst regions. And this can go even more granular into certainly cities, but even suburbs within cities. I mean, there are definitely some areas in the Columbus market that are stronger than others and um, some that have, you know, are, are slower than others. And so you can see um, the gap between active listings and the new listing decrease. And so you can see how the new, the new listing count going down substantially has offset much of the gain in active listings um, and limited that increase. Um, ironically enough, the Northeast has seen um, the, the lowest increase in active listing count, but you can see there the South and the West are up over 100% compared to last year. Again, though, perspective, inventory levels in most major metros and really across the country are at the lowest numbers they've ever been, and in most cases, by a significant margin. So 100% sounds like a lot. Um, in in Columbus, you'll see here in a minute, we're like in that 30 to 40 range. Um, but the reality is that our numbers, we were only, we, the total number of active listings were so low that going up by 40, 50, 60, even 100% is largely insignificant as long as the trend eventually begins to level out. Um, but you can see still here across the country, median listing price year over year is still all positive. Again, though, we're going to see that transition um, for some of these areas, like in the West and the South, um, the West for sure, probably next month, that number will be negative. Um, and so that'll give the media a little bit of, uh, of clickbait um, for themselves. Um, local market. So this is shifting over to central Ohio. One of the interesting things that we saw here, probably the largest gap for sure since December of last year. Um, but certainly, you know, we kind of reversed um, last month and then continued that trend this month where there are more pendings than there were new listings. And that's important because that means that typically that's going to show that we're eating into the active inventory. But we're not doing that because people are taking their home off the market in December, which historically does happen quite a bit. We're eating into this active inventory, meaning the drop from this 3114 down to the 2731. But we're doing that by putting more properties in contract. Um, and so that's significant. If we continue to see more properties going into contract than are being added to the market each month, we're going to start to see the, the dark green, which are the solds and the actives start to normalize again to get us back closer to one month's worth of inventory. You can see down here, December over December, inventory levels are up 45.7%, pendings down 18%. But if we look at um, the first 15 days of January, you can see here that we're actually, our numbers compared to last year are actually up 3.3% with pendings. So remember, our solds in particular are very much a lagging indicator. So it's an indication of what happened 30 to 45 days ago. Um, but what we're seeing here is that our pendings are actually higher than they were last year at this time, which our inventory levels, you can see, we sell between 35 and 40,000 homes a year on average here in central Ohio, and there were only 1,600 available on the market. So that was a large reason why our pendings were really low last January. Um, and so this is a number we want to see, obviously, in the positive because it's foreshadowing how many closings are going to happen in February. Um, but certainly, you know, we have to put that into perspective as well. Um, new listings down for the first 15 days by almost 20%. Um, and new listings in, uh, yeah, this is comparing December to January, which aren't super comparable. So again, the, the moral of what I'm saying to you guys is that overall, the market, in my opinion, is stabilizing. A lot of that, in my opinion, has to do with interest rates, which we're going to jump to in, in a second. But that should be the main talking point. However, if you're not in central Ohio, I would encourage you to go look at these numbers. The big thing you want to look at are what's happening with new listings and what's the trend, meaning were new listings down 20% last month 
and now they're only down 10% this month, or has it been 20% consistently, or was it 20 and now it's 30? Um, and that's an indication, obviously, of, of what inventory is going to look like. But more than anything, your closed units, which is what all of you guys get paid off of, is a direct reflection. Your closings next month are a direct reflection of how many go into contract this month. Um, so be keeping an eye on that. Um, local market, so days on market um, was up again by five days uh, on average. And we've, we're more than double where we were kind of at the, for lack of a better term, peak uh, or low of days on market, which happened over the summer. And it was as low as 12 days here in Central Ohio. Again, keeping in mind, those are going off of sold properties. So there's a little bit of a lag in the increase. One thing that was very interesting, though, um, and it has to do with price reductions, we're looking at original list price to sales price, but we're at 96%. Now, again, that's original list price. So a lot of times to me, this indication, because this is below what historically we would see, um, I would say we're typically in that 97 to 98% in a normal market. And I think what we're seeing here is listing agents that are either listing agents and sellers that are either choosing to overprice or due to a lack of experience in pricing are overpricing. And then having to do either multiple price reductions or being stuck taking a much lower offer. And so I cannot stress to you enough, um, CMA after CMA over the last couple of months has shown me with very, very specific and consistent numbers. If you, if you pull a market analysis for a neighborhood, for example, or an area like a, a city, let's say Hilliard, for example, in, in Columbus and you look at the average days on market for the properties that are currently in contract, that tells you how quickly a, a well-priced, well-conditioned home is going to go into contract. In our market right now, I've seen CMA after CMA where all of the in-contract properties are going into contract within seven to 14 days. And then you have most of the actives, except for the just most recently listed ones, some of them sitting on the market for 100 plus days. And that's a direct correlation of price, condition, location of that property compared to the market. And so you, you if you're not already having these conversations with sellers, you got to be having them that, hey, the market is telling us that if it's priced correctly, and it's in the right condition for the location, obviously, it should sell within seven to 14 days. If it's not selling in that time, you, you're probably overpriced or you need to make upgrades to condition um, or you have to just be willing to wait and you need, you need to give that option to the seller. But at the end of the day, that's it's usually not because the market isn't willing to buy a house within a week. Um, local months of supply. I did not update that, but one thing I will, um, I will go back to this, even though I don't have the updated December number, I want to point out, point this out, a balanced market, according to NAR is four to six months of inventory across the U S we're so far from four to six months of inventory as a whole. I know some, some markets, like I think Phoenix is approaching the four month mark, but that's still just a balanced market. And so it's our job as agents to get that message out there that just because your house doesn't sell in 48 hours with 17 offers doesn't mean that we're in a bad market. And as interest rates start to normalize and people can do a better job planning, if it makes sense for them to move to a new house with the higher rate and that payment is something that falls within their level of comfort, you guys got to explain the fact that price right, condition right, and it will sell, um, that we're still in what I would consider to be relative to a large part of history, a really good seller's market. You can still put your house on the market and sell it reasonably quickly for very close to what you listed it for. Um, and that's our job as agents to make sure that we're getting that out there. Um, average sales price in Columbus, very similar to uh, national. We're up 8.8% .8 compared to last year. 
in December. However, we are down um, month over month by just under a percent from November to December. But again, like we talked about, we've got kind of that normal trend line that we saw back in 17, 18, and 19, where we have a slow drop in prices. We're going to be looking at an increase, an increase starting in January or February of next year. So that um, we're, and that's going to be an indication of whether or not we're returning the normal seasonality or we're expecting kind of a down year when it comes to pricing. Interest rates. Rates have definitely been moving downward. They spiked a little bit in December, um, but then right after the first of the year came back down um, and they've continued on that downward trend. Based on the news that's been coming out, I would anticipate this trend to continue. Um, I don't, I would anticipate the volatility to begin to level off. And that's based on um, what we're looking at here with Fed rate hike, hike predictions. So over the last year, we've had a lot of interest rate hikes. If you look at this chart down here, you can see that we were at 0% at the beginning of last year. And again, remember, Fed funds rate has to do a short term borrowing. So it's not a direct correlation with mortgage rates, um, but it is a direct correlation with your credit card rate, your car loans, your home equity lines of credit are all based off of basically off of the Fed funds rate. So we were at zero. And then basically the Fed just kept raising at every meeting. As you can see, they were raising rates. Everything in blue is the predictions moving forward. And you can see that um, when employment data came out back in, uh, in January, we saw a spike thinking that we might see higher rates, but almost all of the news has been pretty consistent with what the analysts believe the Fed is looking for. So right now, everybody's anticipating that we might see a couple quarter point hikes um, which are the smallest hikes outside of the initial first one that we did last year in April. Um, and then they expect things to flatten out, which is really good. And so typically mortgage rates um, are kind of based off these predictions. And that's why rates have started to decline because everybody in the market believes that the interest rates are either going to stabilize or maybe even that that Fed funds rate are going to stabilize probably for the rest of the year, barring any really bad inflation data. Um, and then on Mortgage News Daily, I'll give the credit for this for sure. Um, that's where this chart, these two last two charts came from. And they showed going back into 2018, the Fed was raising interest rates. And once they plateaued, you can see that the 10-year treasury, which is kind of what mortgage rates go off of, began to drop. Um, didn't drop substantially for the most part, but did begin to drop. And then right before um, things started really slowing down, um, they started dropping a lot. Now, this had to do with the economy. It was getting soft in 2019. And so the Fed started to drop interest rates. And that's what you're seeing here. But you can see how as the Fed was increasing, as soon as the market thought that they were going to lower rates, you can see right here, even though they were technically increasing, mortgage rates were already dropping because they had a feeling that that was the last time. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. So again, as long as everything goes as planned, I would anticipate that we're going to see interest rates continue to either level off or possibly, and I think it's likely that we're probably going to see rates go back down into the mid to lower fives um, by the middle to end of the year, as long as data continues to be consistent as it is right now. All right. So in conclusion, my goal of doing this and sharing this information with you guys is, I mean, I love the fact that you're here and I love spending time with you, but if you leave this Zoom and do nothing with it, we haven't accomplished anything. The whole point of doing this is so that you have pieces of fact to arm yourself with when you go into conversations with buyers, sellers, and investors. The number one reason I believe um, outside of interest rates that we've seen a huge decline in buyer activity and more less about buyer activity and more about buyer decision-making 
is the fact that there is tons of uncertainty in the market. A lot more, even economists that, I mean, I was in the market in 2008, everyone knew it was going down. <laughs> um, right now you can go out there and it's like, everybody is basically saying, well, one of three things is gonna happen. Rates are gonna go up, rates are gonna stay the same, or rates are gonna go down. Oh man, really walking out on the ledge there with that prediction. And that's what everybody's doing. And so companies are trying to make decisions about laying off. You've probably seen headlines where some companies are laying off a bunch of people. Some people are hiring still, and nobody really knows what's going on. They're looking to you as the expert to tell them what your opinion is. People believe in people that have a convicted opinion backed up by fact. The buyer and sellers right now are completely living in an emotional world, and most of it is driven by the media. The cool thing about social media is that most of our clients are probably watching the news less than they're watching social media. And so you have an opportunity through social media, through a newsletter, both written and emailed campaign, through... Um, all different avenues, maybe it's client events and doing a market update at your client events, but to be the economist of choice and to be backed up by facts. The only thing that causes people to make buying and selling decisions when they're uncertain are facts. And those facts can be good and they can be bad. And either way, it's okay because we're not attached. We don't make the market. We only interpret it. But I would highly encourage you to take this information that we've gone over today and figure out what your elevator pitch is going to be. When somebody asks you how work, how business is, or how the real estate market is, you should know exactly how you're going to respond to that. And whether, and, and it's okay if you think in your market prices are falling and the best thing to do is to pause. Like that's okay. Maybe the best thing to do for your client right now is to rent out their house and go buy when the market's low and go rent out their house for the next year or two and then sell it once the market once the market recovers that can sometimes be it and i promise you if you have the confidence in your predictions to offer those kinds of options <clears throat> they may still decide to sell with you but they're not going to be nearly as mad in 2 years when their neighbor's house next door is selling for 50,000 more than what they sold for because you gave them your opinion, you gave them the information and then ultimately they made that decision. I do still believe <clears throat> that as rates continue to go down, they're still going to be higher. I mean, this is a guarantee. They're still going to be higher than 95% of your clients mortgage rates. And so understanding different types of loans like points buy downs, adjustable rate mortgages. Some, some buyers of ours have been able to pay points on a mortgage and make a really significant change in their interest rate. And I think that the, the value of points is going to continue to increase in the short term as we trend down um, for a number of technical reasons, which I won't bore you with. But I just think make sure that you're talking to your, your lending partners and making sure that your lending partners are explaining to the buyers what the options are with regards to reducing their interest rate and how much that's going to cost. And if you're in a market where sellers are not selling quickly, then leverage your negotiation to get closing costs paid by the seller, which can in most cases be up to 3%. Some cases can be up to 6% of the loan amount to pay for some of these buy downs on interest rates so that you can get your buyers into the property at a reasonable rate. And I can that conversation alone could probably get you five to 10 sales this year if you get really good at it and get a lending partner that gets really good at explaining the value of buying now when demand is lower, potentially getting a much better price. And then as rates go down, if the rates go down enough, they can always refinance. Um, but you know, you can't go back to pricing from four months ago. And I think my opinion is, is that there's going to be a bunch of buyers out there that want to, that are going to be wishing that they bought houses between September of 22 and June of 23. That's my prediction. We'll see if I'm right. Um, lastly, in a nutshell, 
This is only my opinion, obviously, but I anticipate that inventory levels are going to be can stay low compared to historical norms, meaning they're going to be higher than last year, but they're not going to be out of this world crazy. Um, I think if you're in a growing city and that has low inventory, the increases in, in inventory are going to be short lived. I think it could I think they could go away. And we could be right back where we were last year at this time, as soon as March or April, depending on how quickly mortgage rates go down. Um, and I think all of that, that increase in buyer demand is going to be caused by, by lower rates if it happens. Otherwise, we're probably, if rates just plateau, I predict we'll probably have just a slow, steady climb in buyer demand. Um, and that's going to be largely due to the fact that rents are still more expensive than mortgages in most markets when you look at the averages. And so there's really not a lot of value unless somebody thinks that they're going to need to move in the next three years of taking on a rent payment that's going to be going up every single year for the next three years versus locking in worst case scenario with a mortgage and then likely being able to refi in 12 to 24 months and lower their payment instead of that rent payment that's going to keep going up. The last conversation um, that I would be prepared for, and I would be communicating this as a way, again, to bring value to the average buyer and seller probably doesn't mean a ton, um, but it could mean something to your seller that falls into this category. Credit card, credit card balances are up 15% year over year. Um, most articles attribute that to the fact that people created a lifestyle during the pandemic when they weren't spending money. They created a living lifestyle in their city. And now that they've begun to go on vacations and I know for us, like travel sports and different things like that have all kicked back into high gear. People have much higher expenses on top of everything that they're doing is just costing more from energy to food prices. Um, if they're renters to rent prices, um, and if they're selling and buying, obviously their, their interest rates going up. And so costs are going up across the board. And most consumers have, haven't made the choice to change their lifestyle. They've just started swiping the credit card once they ran through their savings. So my prediction is, is that a lot more sellers or a lot more homeowners are going to be going to banks to get home equity lines of credit, start to pay off those credit cards. And one of the reasons they're going to be doing that, and I know a local lender here, well, they're a regional lender here in Columbus, is working on a way to get a home equity line in five days. And if they're able to accomplish that, it's going to be the advertising pitch is going to go something like this. Credit cards higher than you'd like, tired of paying 25% interest on your credit card. Come get a home equity line today and take advantage of the average American that has $125,000 in home equity at just a 7.5% interest rate. 1-800, get your home equity line now. That's going to be the, uh, the advertisement. All right, sources, mortgagenewsdaily.com, realtor.com for um, the national data, and then trend graphics for the local data. Um, who has questions? Anybody? Andrea, you're first in my box, so I'm going to pick on you. Oh, no, I have no questions. That was great. Thank you. Anybody else have questions about how to use the data to have those conversations? No? These will, you're, these will be posted on the um, one team app, right? The, your slides. Um, email me if I can do that, I will. I don't know if there's a way, but if you email me at either Troy at marshhomegroup.com or Troy re at Gmail, I'll have Allison send them to you. Um, and I'll actually ask Abby if there's a way that I can post the slides and then I could just have, um, have Allison do that for those of you that are in one team. If you're not part of one team, then just email me again, Troy R E at Gmail, and I'll have Allison send these over to you. Hi, I have a quick question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, what do you say or what are your talking points around people who always bring up the foreclosure question? So, um, and especially I have some investor clients who are all, they're like waiting for a bunch of foreclosures to happen. Obviously the lending practices 
are much different than they were 0708 people have more equity but what is your um general opinion on that yeah it's a great question and lots of people predict it um and i'll tell you the reason why they do it is because many adults have only been through one recession and that was a recession caused by housing yeah um that's not the normal recession though um, so that's the first conversation. People need to understand that just because that's what happened in 08 doesn't mean that it's going to happen this time. And frankly, that was the anomaly. Um, and so, but but look at the data. So if yeah. you just type in the Google uh, foreclosure data, there are tons of websites that have that. And what you'll see is that foreclosures, I believe foreclosures might even be down year over year. But the facts behind it are are two things. Number one, um, unemployment is still at historical lows. Yeah. So what usually causes foreclosures is when people lose their job and they can't make their payment anymore. But this second one is the reason why most people aren't going to go to foreclosure. And that is that they have a crap ton of equity. And so in 2008, even though prices had been rising during the mid 2000s, it was nothing, at least here in Columbus, the pace at which they were rising was three to 5%. The national average for appreciation was like 15 to 20% for the last couple of years. Yeah. And so that alone um, has given people a ton of equity. And so they will just choose to sell. Many of them though, and here's what my advice would be, many of those people will sell to uh, investors to take the easy way out because they don't have money to do improvements. And that's the last thing and kind of the third thing that I would say. In 2008, we didn't have people texting us 17 times a day telling us that they were willing to buy our house for cash with no, no, uh, no strings attached. And so what oftentimes so many people, and for those of you that are on the call that were here in 2008, how many sellers did you talk to after the fact, when they had already foreclosed that had enough equity, but emotionally, they just were not, they were beat down. They had lost their job. They had to tell their kids that they had to move to a new school because they didn't save their money and manage their money. Like people took it on the chin and took it to heart. And so to call someone and say like, I need to sell my house and I don't know that I can make the payment. That's hard for people to do. But right now we have the best telemarketers in the world calling all of us all the time saying, hey, here's a get out of jail free card and I'm willing to pay off your mortgage and you get to go start over. I'm going to make it hassle free for you. Um, and I think those three things together will keep foreclosures low unless one of two things happen. Obviously, if both of them happen, then all bets are off. But unless yeah. we see a major decline in pricing, which hasn't happened yet or we see um, really high unemployment, yeah, which also hasn't happened. And if there's any reason why interest rates would not go down and the Fed would not stop raising rates, it would be unemployment because it's not going, unemployment is not going up um, the way that a lot of people anticipated it would, which could lead to more inflation potentially. Thank you. Yep, anybody else? No. All right. Well, you guys feel free to reach out with me in, to me in between, but I'm usually almost always the third Monday, right? That's what we're on. The third Monday of the month at one o'clock is my normal time. Um, and so feel free to share links. I'd love for you guys to come back and don't forget, email me if you want the slides. I think Abby's going to post them in the one team app. If you don't have the One Team app because you're not part of our uh, One Team network, just email me, Troy, R-E, Troy Real Estate at gmail.com. Thanks for coming, guys.